Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia, and today I am talking to Yasmin Garcia and Perth Rosen from UCP Wheels for Humanity. Um, I have been delighted to meet both Yasmin and Perth through developing the wheelchair course because they created some amazing content on the multidisciplinary team um, in service wheelchair service provision. So we're going to talk to them a little bit about that today. But before we start, maybe Yasmin and Perth, you could just introduce yourselves to everyone and just say a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure, I'll go ahead. Thanks, Rachel, um, for offering the opportunity to contribute to the work that you're doing. We see it as a great opportunity to increase the co competency and capacity worldwide for appropriate wheelchair service provision, along with work that our other colleagues are doing. So um, appreciate the opportunity and, and the work that you guys are doing. And um, my name is Perth Rosen. I am the director of programs at UCP Wheels for Humanity. Um, we implement programs that build competency and capacity around access to appropriate wheelchair provision and rehabilitation in low and middle income countries with the idea that all of our programming centers around the beneficiary, whether that's a wheelchair user or a family member or caretaker um, or a hospital setting where multidisciplinary teams support those individuals. Uh, I am Jasmine Garcia. I am a rehabilitation engineer and I am a technical advisor for UCP Wheels for Humanity. Um, and that's it. Okay, thank you so much for both of you for your introduction and it's nice to hear more about what you both do, what the organization does, UCP Wheels for Humanity. Um, so you both created um, some great content in Physiopedia on the multidisciplinary team and I was wondering if you could just have a chat a little bit about the multidisciplinary team for wheelchair service provision today um, and just talk to us a little bit about perhaps what is the perfect um, multidisciplinary team, who is involved and, and how does that vary around the world because I imagine in different settings there is quite a variability and how we might address that. Sure, I can, I can try to answer that um, in an imperfect way and then pass it on to Yasmin who, who has more direct service provision, um, speaking more from the way we've implemented programs globally. And you know, I think um, wheelchair service provision is often not um, considered in, in terms of a multidisciplinary team in low and middle income countries, primarily because there are so few resources um, both training as well as health workforce to build their capacity in the specifics of wheelchair service provision. So it happens ad hoc and it happens in a rather decentralized way, which is quite the opposite from this concept of a multidisciplinary team where individuals have their professional kind of boundaries and work together to support an individual to meet their, in this case, rehabilitation goals or or mobility or functional um, mobility goals. And, and because of the environment especially, and we do work exclusively in low and middle income countries, uh, wheelchair service is considered kind of an, a standalone um, activity that happens within a service delivery model. Um, in, in many cases associated with a technician, the individual who will repair or prepare and maintain a wheelchair and, and perhaps community members that will support with the referral and follow-up. In some scenarios, depending on the service delivery model, there are opportunities to embed the individual with wheelchair training, um, wheelchair seating, fitting, um, modification competency within a wider team of um, rehabilitation specialists, psychosocial case management specialists, um, and other community resources, which I see as part of this multidisciplinary team in the best of cases. It's not just a clinical team, it's also uh, expands out to all of the needs that an individual would have uh, to meet their functional mobility goals. So I, I, I struggle to see a perfect um, multidisciplinary team. I think the perfect team is a attention and an appreciation of needing to work together in the community based on the resources that exist to develop a service delivery model and team that supports an individual um, 
along the continuum of their lifetime to achieve their goals. Because as we know, people change and their needs change. So perhaps Yasmin can speak a little bit more to the positions um, that would more typically um, complement each other in a multidisciplinary team setting um, where individuals might be more well resourced to give a concept um, for what a multidisciplinary team would look like in wheelchair service delivery. Well, in terms of position or the type of professionals that need to be involved in the team, it depends also on the individual's needs. For instance, a person who doesn't have a lot of uh, positioning uh, or yeah, a lot of positioning needs, they may need only like a physical therapist or a occupational therapist who is well training in doing the assessment and identify any, um, any support or element of the wheelchair that will help the person to be more, um, to be seated in an upright position or to be more functional in the wheelchair. But for instance, in more complex cases, uh, there is a need to involve more clinical professionals such as orthopedic surgeons, uh, uh, physical uh, PM&R, a uh, doctor in physical medicine and rehabilitation, uh, a neurologist, so it could be more complex. So in terms of the best, um, of the best medical or uh, multidisciplinary team, it depends on what the individual needs. So the goal is to be able to identify uh, the, the needs of the person and be able to refer or at least know where to, who, where to refer and to whom to refer the person. Um, what else I can say? Um, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like there are there are obviously many different circumstances around the world and many different contexts and there'll be many different professionals available in each of those contexts and it sounds like what you're saying is that you don't need to have a perfect multidisciplinary team um, available so people that don't have a full team as it might be um, sort of listed in some places don't need to feel disadvantaged in any way because you know the wheelchair service provision can happen appropriately without a without the full multidisciplinary team but with as long as the essential people are available yeah i i think that's right and i i would add you know as yasmin said this referral this understanding identifying what an individual's needs are and knowing what the resources in your community are to be able to refer i think that's such a key point um, to managing access, but also to not assuming we all know what the, the, the appropriate team will look like. I mean, with, with spinal cord injury, we know that bladder and bowel management is important. Um, it doesn't mean the, the wheelchair service provider needs to be an expert in, in bladder management. And they would, however, um, need to know or ideally have a list of resources for where to refer someone and recognize where there's gaps also in the country in capacity around managing issues of bladder and bowel management for persons with spinal cord injury. So um, it's a continuum and m mapping resources is an important component, I think, of, of working as a team, a wider team. So it's probably a nice exercise for people um, who are watching this video or doing the wheelchair course that we are um, delivering. It's probably a nice exercise for them to make sure that they are aware that they explore and are aware what services are available within their community and what professionals are available within their community to um, ensure that they are doing the most appropriate wheelchair service provision. Um, and it's important that they find that out and, and have those services available to them. Absolutely, well, well said. And I think that's part of kind of, you know, looking at this as a service delivery model. Um, if in the absence of an organization or a healthcare system that takes care of ensuring that people who need access to assistive technology, in this case, wheelchairs, have access and have appropriate care, then it really is the community's um, 
responsibility and opportunity to define what the service model looks like, who the key actors are, who's available and interested in supporting. And I say who because it's not always a clinical person. It can be a, a champion in the community. It can be um, a faith-based group even at times that support with the referrals. But there will be cases where a secondary health care provider um, isn't, is needed if there's a urinary tract infection or if there's some sort of pressure um, pressure sore that needs to be attended to or debrided, you would want to get a nurse involved. And, and recognizing those community resources around general needs of wheelchair users who are not all equal <laughs> um, is really important and also just points to the complexity of this. It, the, the, the wheelchair service provision space is not straightforward. The, the wheelchair itself, um, we've, we've we've sort of left out the technical folks and, and the training and the very important training that empowers individuals to maintain their product, to maximize the utility of the product through wheelchair service skills training, um, and then perhaps even the community groups of wheelchair users themselves that share information and resources about um, navigating life in that particular context in a wheelchair. And I think Yasmin has has some experience um, in Mexico around that. I don't know, Yasmin, if you want to speak to some of the wheelchair skills building that's happened um, in Mexico and the importance of that as part of this wider concept of a of, of a service model. Yes, actually, well, in places where where the environment is not that accessible. Uh, wheelchair skills tr training is very important. Like I have seen persons who even without the, the appropriate wheelchair, they are able to do a lot, of, a lot of things, go out to the communities because they know wheelchair skills. So this is a very important uh, portion of the provision. We could provide the best or the more appropriate wheelchair, but if we don't teach wheelchair skills, the person won't be able to go outside independently to the community. So, um, and there are many groups, like for, for instance, in Mexico, there is a very good organization also who does a lot of work in training persons on wheelchair, uh, on wheelchair skills. And there are a lot of uh, persons with uh, spinal cord injury that might be very high and they are very independent and very, they are really maximizing their independence while in their wheelchair. So teaching the person how to move uh, in the wheelchair, what to do in the case uh, of a fall from the wheelchair, how to fall the right way and how to uh, be able to go back to the wheelchair is important and also where to go in the case of a major technical problem. This is very important skills that need to be teach, uh, taught to the to the wheelchair users and not only to them, but also to the service providers. And if they are not able or if they are, do not have the tools to do it, they need to know where to refer the person or the wheelchair users to get this maintenance and repair service. Um, I think that's, that's what I can say. And I, and, and I guess one of the consistent members of the team in all of this is the carer or the family or uh, the, yeah the carer or the family and and do they what what's the how would you describe their sort of role within this multidisciplinary team sort of context that we're talking about um, well many of the not all of the wheelchair users are may be able to be independent uh, or to be go outside the community by themselves. Many of the wheelchair users may need somebody uh, who speaks for them. For example, kids with uh, children with very severe cerebral palsy. So it's very important to involve the caregiver uh, in the in the wheelchair provision uh, service or in the team because they know exactly what the wheelchair user may need. Uh, also. Uh, even for those wheel, uh, wheelchair users who are able to 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 say why they need, what they need, sometimes they are not able to identify uh, if there is another thing 
with that they are needing. For instance, if somebody is already very tired about propelling their wheelchair every day, uh, they may not notice this, but the caregiver or the person or the family member who is next to them, they, they notice that. So they are able also to communicate this to the to the wheelchair provision team, and then they can find a a solution to the problem. So, uh, including the caregivers, the the family members, or whoever is uh, with the wheelchair user all the time is very important because they will flag other issues that maybe the wheelchair user haven't noticed before. Yeah, always worth remembering. Um to include the family and the carer within the team, yeah. Um, okay, so I think that's been a really nice um, roundup of how the multidisciplinary team may differ in different circumstances and contexts and how we can make sure that um, all the people involved in wheelchair service provision are available if we need them, if, you know, if they're not within your immediate community where you can find those people within your community. Is there anything else either of you would like to share on this topic um, before we end today? I think I would just add that um, context matters as we've discussed and different um, resource settings will allow for different configurations of a surface delivery model and it is important that we as individuals in the mix are always looking to either advocate for or support directly in the design of improved policies that do set standards so that the quality of the service provision isn't ad hoc, even if the configuration of the team is. And I think that's where training such as the training that you guys are providing, um, the ISWP's training and certification and accreditation come to play the work that the WHO is doing to try and support rehabilitation um, standards in country. And so I just want to make sure that we're not sort of passing the buck saying each location is different and therefore there is no perfect um, service delivery model. And that might always be true, but we do need to ensure that there is some quality for the protection of, of individuals around the way that services are being provided. So. Um, we have a dual track responsibility to be flexible in mind in the way and creative in the way that we map our resources and identify how to refer people and keep mindful of the fact that we don't want to lose sight of the policies and structures and, and accreditation and expectations of quality service provision. Yeah, very good point. And, and it's a really nice roundup to the conversation that we've just had. Um, uh, a good summary and a good, um, definitely important for everyone to consider that as well. Um, Yasmin, is there anything else you would like to share today? Oh, just don't uh, lose the point that uh, the wheelchair that is being provided, uh, provided needs to be functional. So sometimes, uh, the the person or the service providers they may not have the uh, the clinical background, but if they have in mind that the wheelchair is not a uh, medical device only, that is also a device that improves function. I think this is a very important thing. A wheelchair needs to uh, uh, needs to provide the person the functionality to go out to work to go to school. Uh, to increase their independence. So sometimes uh, the clinical professionals, we just focus on, on the medical aspects of the wheelchair, but we need to focus also on the functional aspect of the wheelchair. So I think that will be something that I just want to, for everybody to keep in mind. Okay. Very good. Uh, this has been a really good conversation. Um, it's a really nice uh, to talk to you both about uh, service delivery and how the team is involved in that service delivery. And there's definitely a few things there for people to think about and to have a think about going away and doing um, after they've watched this video. Um, so uh, thank you both so much for joining me today. Um, unless there's anything else either of you would like to share, 
Uh, where can we find out more about UCP Wheels for Humanity um, if people want to find out more about what you guys get up to? Oh, great. Thanks for that um, set up there, Rachel. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, please do look on our um, UCP Wheels for humanity.org, um, as well as CLASP, which is um, a supply chain mechanism for accessing appropriate wheelchairs that are affordable for low and middle income countries. It's a project that we run and gets at some of what Yasmin was saying in her final notes about the wheelchair is not just a medical device, it's a tool for freedom and independence and has supportive mechanisms for uh, functional mobility if chosen appropriately. So if any of the viewers find themselves in a low resourced environment where inappropriate products um, abound and they recognize the gap, uh, clasp.org uh, clasp uh, can provide a nice resource for accessing appropriate products. And also we're on Twitter and Facebook um, and we look forward to engaging with anybody interested in this topic. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you both so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. You too, Rachel.